My name is Sam Vaknin, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. In July 2011, South Sudan became a new state by seceding from Sudan, following decades of civil war and a referendum. When Kosovo attained its independence in February 2008, some pundits warned against this precedent-setting event, and foresaw a disintegration of sovereign states from Belgium all the way to Russia. This time around, their apocalyptic Cassandra predictions having miserably failed, they remained mum and wisely kept to themselves. So how does international law treat and distinguish insurgents from terrorists, from freedom fighters, from national liberation movements? Traditionally, the international community has been reluctant to treat civil strife the same way that it treats international armed conflict. No one thinks that encouraging an endless succession of tribal or ethnic secessions is a good idea. In their home territories, insurgents are initially invariably labeled as, and treated by the lawful lawful government as, criminals or terrorists, at least in the initial stage. Paradoxically, though, the longer and more all-pervasive the conflict, and the tighter the control of the rebels on people residing in the territories in which the insurgents habitually operate, the better the the chances of the rebels or insurgents to acquire modicum, some international recognition and standing. In other words, international law actually eggs on rebels to prolong and escalate conflicts rather than resolve them peacefully and speedily. I repeat, the longer the conflict, the tighter the control of the rebels on the territories, the higher their chances to be recognized internationally. By definition, insurgents are temporary, transient, or provisional international subjects. As Antonio Cassese puts it in his tome, International Law, published by Oxford University Press in 2001, insurgents are quelled by the government and disappear, or they seize power, and install themselves in place of the government, or they secede and join another state, or they become a new international subject, in other words, a new state. In other words, being an intermediate phenomenon, rebels can never claim sovereign rights over territory. Sovereign states can make contracts with insurrectionary parties. They can, states can demand that such parties for instance, afford protection and succor to foreigners within the territories affected by their activities. But this type of agreement-making, this type of contracting, is not a symmetrical relationship. The rebellious party cannot make any reciprocal demand on the state. Still, once entered into, these agreements are enforceable, and both parties can use all lawful sanctions and apply to all instances of courts, internationally and domestically. Third-party states are allowed to provide assistance, even of a military nature, to governments, but not to insurgents, with the exception of humanitarian aid. This is not the case when it comes to national liberation movements. So how do we distinguish insurgents from national liberation movements? How can anyone tell? According to the first Geneva Protocol of 1977 and subsequent conventions, there is a difference between freedom fighters and national liberation movements and insurgents and terrorists. A national liberation movement represents a collective, a nation or a people, in its fight to liberate itself from foreign or colonial domination or from an inequitable, for instance, racist, regime. National liberation movements maintain an organizational structure, although they may or may not be in control of a territory. They may operate in exile, for instance. National liberation movements must aspire to gain domination of the land and the oppressed population thereon. National liberation movements uphold the principle of self-determination and are thus instantaneously deemed to be internationally legitimate. Though less important from the point of view of international law, the instant recognition by other states that follows the establishment of a national liberation movement has enormous 
practical consequences. States are allowed to extend help, including economic and military assistance, short of armed troops. Uh, states are duty-bound to refrain from assisting a state denying self-determination to a people or a group entitled to it, according to Cassis. As opposed to mere insurgents, national liberation movements can claim and assume the right to self-determination. The rights and obligations of use in bello, the legal principles pertaining to the conduct of armed hostilities, are also um, can also be adopted by national liberation movements, as are the rights and obligations pertaining to treaty making and diplomatic immunity. Yet even national liberation movements are not allowed to act as full-fledged sovereigns. For instance, they cannot dispose of land or natural resources within the disputed territory. In this case, though, the lawful government or colonial power are similarly barred from such dispositions. Both sides are limited in what they can do as long as the conflict continues. Internal armed conflict in international law is a fraught and complicated subject. Rebels and insurgents are not lawful combatants or belligerents. Rather, they are held to be simple criminals by their own state and by the majority of other states. They do not enjoy the status of prisoner of war when they are captured. Ironically, only the lawful government can upgrade the status of the insurrectionists from bandits to lawful combatants. This is called recognition of belligerency. How the government chooses to fight rebels and insurgents is therefore not regulated by international law. As long as the government refrains from intentionally harming civilians and committing crimes of war or crimes against humanity, it can do very much as it pleases. But international law is in flux, and increasingly civil strife is being internationalized. It is treated as a run-of-a-mill bilateral or even multilateral armed conflict. The doctrine of human rights intervention on behalf of an oppressed people has gained traction, hence Operation Allied Force in Kosovo in 1999 and the current operation in Libya. Moreover, if a civil war expands and engulfs third-party states, and if these insurgents are well organized both as an armed force and as a civilian administration of the territory being fought over, it is today commonly accepted that the conflict should be regarded and treated as international. As the second Geneva Protocol of 1977 makes crystal clear, mere uprisings or riots, such as in Macedonia in 2001, are still not covered by the international rules of war, except for the general principles related to non-combatants and their protection, for instance, through Article 3 of the four 1949 Geneva Conventions. And, of course, customary law applies, proscribing the use of chemical weapons, land and anti-personnel mines, booby traps, types of ammunition, and cluster bombs, and dum-dum bullets, and so on. So, both parties, the state and the insurrectionary group, the insurgents, are bound by these few rules and nothing else. If they violate these rules, they may be committing war crimes and crimes against humanity. But everything else they do is not covered by international law and hence legal and legitimate. So how does international law treat secession? The new state of Kosovo has been immediately recognized by the United States, Germany and other major European powers. The Canadian Supreme Court made clear in its ruling on the Quebec case in 1998 that the status of statehood is not conditioned upon such recognition, but that, quote, the viability of a would-be state in the international community depends, as a practical matter, upon recognition by other states. The constitutional law or some, of some federal states provides for a mechanism for orderly secession. The constitutions of both the USSR and the uh, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia dated 1974, incorporated such provisions for orderly secession. In other cases, the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom come to mind, the supreme echelons of the judicial system had to step in and rule 
regarding the right to secession, its procedures, and its mechanisms. Again, facts on the ground determine international legitimacy. As early as 1877, in the wake of the bloodiest secessionist war of all time, the American Civil War, which took place between 60, 1861 and 1865, so in the wake of this war, the Supreme Court of the United States wrote in its decision of William v. Brophy, the validity of the secessionist acts, both against the parent state and its citizens and subjects, depends entirely upon its ultimate success. If it failed to establish itself permanently, all such acts perish with it. If it succeed and become recognized, its acts from the commencements of it, commencement of its existence are upheld as those of, a, of an independent nation. In other words, might is right. In the creation of states in international law, published by Clarendon Press in 2006, James Crawford suggests that there is no internationally recognized right to secede, and that secession is a legally neutral act. I tend to disagree. As Alexander Popkovich observes in his book, with contributions by Peter Radin, Creating New States, Theory and Practice of Secession, published by Ashgate in 2007, the universal legal right to self-determination encompasses the universal legal right to secede. The Albanians in Kosovo are a people, according to the decisions of the Badinter Commission. But though they occupy a well-defined and demarcated territory, their land is within the borders of an existing state, or was. In this strict sense, their unilateral secession does set a precedent. It goes against the territorial definition of a people as embedded in the United Nations Charter and subsequent conventions. Still, the general drift of international law, for instance as interpreted by Canada's Supreme Court, is to allow that a state can be composed of several peoples and that its cultural ethnic constituents have the right to self-determination. And this seems to uphold the 19th century concept of a homogeneous nation-state over the French model of a civil state of all citizens, regardless of ethnicity or religious creed. Pavkovich contends that, according to Principle 5 of the United Nations General Assembly's Declaration of Principles of International Law concerning friendly relations and cooperation among states in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations, quite a long name, well, according to this declaration, the right to territorial integrity overrides the right to self-determination. Thus, if a state is made up of several peoples or nations, its right to maintain itself intact and to avoid being dismembered or impaired is paramount, and it prevails over the right of its constituent peoples to secede. But the right to territorial integrity is limited in some respects. It is limited to states conducting themselves in compliance with the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples, and thus it is possessed of a government representing the whole people belonging to the territory without distinction as to race, creed, or color. The words as to race, creed, or color in the text supra have been replaced with the words of any kind in the 1995 declaration of the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the United Nations. In other words, a country, a state, has a right to territorial integrity only if it treats all its citizens equitably, equally, without discrimination on any grounds, and with uh, fraternity and with equal opportunity. If it does not, it loses its rights to territorial integrity. Yugoslavia under Milosevic failed this test in its treatment of the Albanian minority within its borders. Albanians were relegated to second-class citizenship, derided blatantly and discriminated against in every turn. Thus, according to Principle 5, the Kosovars had a clear right to unilaterally secede. As early as 1972, an international commission of juries wrote in a report titled The Events in East Pakistan, 1971. They wrote, 
This principle of territorial integrity is subject to the requirement that the government does comply with the principle of equal rights and does represent the whole people without distinction. If one of the constituent peoples of a state is denied equal rights and is discriminated against, their full right of self-determination will revive. A quarter of a century later, Canada's Supreme Court concurred in its Quebec decision in 1998. This court said, the international law right to self-determination only generates at best a right to external self-determination in situations where a definable group is denied meaningful access to governments, to government, to pursue their political, economic, social, and cultural development. In his seminal tome, Self-Determination of Peoples, a Legal Appraisal, Cambridge University Press, 1995, Antonio Cassese neatly sums up this exception to the right of territorial integrity enjoyed by sovereign states. He says, When the central authorities of a sovereign state persistently refuse to grant participatory rights to a religious or racial group, grossly and systematically trample upon their fundamental rights and deny the possibility of reaching a peaceful settlement within the framework of the state structure, a racial or religious group may secede once it is clear that all attempts to achieve internal self-determination have failed or are destined to fail. Amen.